you're finding a word that you can't understand would be change the pronunciation from how you think you might pronounce it. For instance, the word coney. Okay, actually, the pronunciation of a coney is a cunny. And a cunny is a bunny. So if you were just trying a different way to pronounce it, you could figure out that a coney is really a cunny, which is really a bunny. Or beeves. Say, well, I think I'll try to pronounce that a different way. Beefs. It's really beef. Or a merce is a mercy. So try different pronunciations of words. Now, actually, when the Scottish and Irish immigrants came from Ireland and Scotland to America and settled in this part of the United States, they were using good, proper English, okay? And they're still using good, proper English. It's the rest of America that's gone awry, okay? So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But, for instance, a word like beget, Okay, now that's a verb, you, you know, you beget someone. But what it really means, when you have an imperative case verb, like beget, befall, these are all verbs, there's an implied you in front of it. So really, what that is, is you begetting. I mean, that's really what it is. Or the word befall, you befallen. Behold, you beholden. Beseech, you be seeking. Bemoan, you be moaning. Belie, you be lying. <laughs> and a right, a, a right is a right bit funny. I mean, that's really what it is. And so that is a correct usage, and the rest of America is not correctly pronouncing the English language. So <laughs> let them know I told you that. <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing that you can do if you find a difficult word is change the spelling in your mind. And don't change it in the Bible, but just change it in your mind. Like a canker would be a cancer. Uh, a coffer, just change the R to N as a coffin. Concision is really incision. Uh, Coulter is cutlery, fli flipping the T and the L. A Chapman, we saw before, is a cheap man. Um, <laughs> dry shod is dry shoed. Hemorrhoid is, was in the Bible, it's emeroids. You know, Preparation H took the H and they kept it, and so the Bible just has the emeroid. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other trick that you can use is to look inside words, okay? Now, when you see a word like al albeit, you think, well, what does all be it mean? Break it up into its parts. Be it. Okay? Can you see the be in the it? Okay? Or a foot. It's about a foot. A gone is gone. A miss is miss. Backbite is bite back. Chapiter is really cap. Okay, now the word chastise, this really helped me, this word, when the Lord chastises that. Look at the first part of the word chastise. It's the word chaste. And chastise really simply means to make chaste. So that's a more positive way to look at being chastised when it happens to you. Uh, centurion, look at the word cent, and it's one out of a hundred. A cent is one out of a hundred. So a centurion is one, a man out of a hundred. Uh, dropsy is a funny word in the Old Testament. Look at the word drop. It's water drops. It's someone who has water retention. So dropsy is water retention, actually. Um, enchantment, see the word chant inside. Embolden, you can see the word bold inside. So look inside words, break them apart, and normally you'll find uh, something that will help you understand that word. Now I'm going to show you how God uses parallelisms once again. He uses them in whole sentences. Now here we have the difficult word appertain, okay? Number 16, the very first time appertain shows up in the Bible. The Bible says, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, comma, with all that appertain unto them. Now, God repeats the very words that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, comma. So when, when you see God repeating something, he's going to tell you the same thing all over again, but he's going to use different words in case you didn't understand it the first time. Comma, their house, all the men, and all their goods. So appertain must mean all their house, all the men, and all their goods. And if you didn't get it from that, you would get it from inside. The word appertain is the word pertain. And Webster says that pertain is the definition of the word. Um, look at the word deck. Okay, here's a parallelism. Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency. Array thyself with glory and beauty. You can, you can line this up. These are both verbs. Deck means array. So when you look up deck in the Webster's Dictionary, it's going to say array. Well, God's already put array right there. Thyself, thyself, he's repeating. With and with, he's repeating. Those are both prepositions. These are both subjects. These are both verbs. And he's repeating it, and you're going to fill in the blank, and you're going to say deck means array. <clears throat> okay. 
Now, the other thing that God does, I found, to define words is to use their opposite. For instance, bold. Okay? The Bible says in Exodus 9, the flax was bold. Well, I didn't know what bold meant. Okay? But the wheat and the rye were not grown up. So, obviously, the but there in those sentences is telling me that uh, flax is going to be, what's ever happening to the flax is the opposite of what is happening to these others. This is not up. Okay? So the definition of bold, when you look over in Webster's, is puffed up. Okay? <clears throat> now, uh, when you're looking for a definition, the Bible often uses what linguists call a collocational restrictions. Now, let me give you an example. If I say excruciating to you, okay, there are only four or five words that can come to your mind. You couldn't say excruciating birthday cake. You know, you couldn't say, you have to say excruciating pain, excruciating, there are certain words that, that our mind or the culture has built up associations with. So what the Bible does is very interesting. Take the word common, okay? Now who knows what a common is? You know, I don't know what a common is, so I put that in my list, all right? Now, when I found the word in the Bible, it was with the word plowman, plow, sow, ground, and it was with all those words. And they're all of a sudden they're talking about this common business. Well, what I found was that 100 times God had used the word plow, sow, and ground with the word seed. Now, this time he's omitting the word seed. He's replacing the word com with common there. So when you're, you're, the way a computer works is <clears throat> your mind is going to key in plow, sow, and ground. It's going to bring up the word seed in your mind. So if he's throwing whatever this is, he's not throwing dresses, he's not throwing cows. Do you know what I'm saying? That word seed is going to come up in your mind. And so you, you will automatically understand what, what that word is, even if you don't consciously or you're not consciously aware that you understand what that word is. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> the King James Bible uses something called um, families of morphologically related words. <clears throat> For instance, ill, evil, devil, vile, villain, vilify. Okay, if a child knew what evil was or devil, they could look at the word vile and sort of get the idea that something vile was something of the devil or to vilify, or a villain was someone who was devilish, vilify. Okay, God will build up an understanding for a young person, starting with a small word, I noticed, in Genesis, and working his way up. Or a child might know the word ear, but they might know, not know hearken. He will start early in the Bible using the word ear, build up to the word hear, then he'll build up to the word hearken. But still, you can see the word ear inside the word hear. So that's not really a problem. For instance, I found that, we'll take a compound word like horseback. Okay, he'll define horse, or he'll define back in Genesis 14, uh, horse in Genesis 49, and then he uses the compound word horse back in 2 Kings. So he didn't throw that on a child immediately without first giving them uh, some definition of horse and definition of back. Now, let's take a difficult word like, I can't even say the word, acceptation. Okay, you think, why would God, you know, put a word like that in there and expect someone to understand what acceptation means? Well, what he did is he started in the book of Genesis, and he used the word accept, okay? Leviticus, he made that a little fancier, and he said acceptable. Job, then he got archaic, and he said accepteth. Isaiah, acceptance. And it wasn't until 1 Timothy, when someone had read almost all the way through the Bible, did he use the word acceptation. So he didn't just throw it at the child or something like that. He's building up an understanding, and he's building up a, a use of the English language. Remember, he's the word. He thinks words are very important because we think with words, don't we? Okay, now let's take a word like couch. God will start in Genesis 49, 4 with a simple noun, couch. Okay? He's going to give you the OED, Oxford English Dictionary's definition of a couch, which is a bed. The primary definition of a couch is a bed in the Oxford English Dictionary. So there it is, right in the verse, a bed. Now just so you'll get the drift that a couch is a bed, he uses possessives, father's bed, my couch, okay? Now, just a few verses later, Genesis 49 now, he's going to make this into a verb. He's going to get a little bit more complex here. And he's going to say, couched. Well, the, the Oxford English Dictionary says, couched is to go down. Okay, well, God told us that right there. He stooped down. 
Now, in case we didn't catch that, he's going to use identical words, a seven-letter word here, a seven-letter word there, stooped couch. They not only both have seven letters, they both end E-D. Okay, if we didn't catch that, he's got these ow sounds, roused, couched, to hook that together. Okay, ow, down, and then in verse 8, he's using the word bow down. So he's got all these ow sounds in all that verse. Okay, then it isn't until verse 14, a little bit further down, that he gets into this, what's called a complex verbal substantive. And he's, he, couching is a gerund or something like that. So um, he's building up an understanding in a child's mind of the English language. So perhaps using one of those um, Bibles that supposedly uh, chronological Bible, what really happened first, if you use that exclusively, you would not be able to understand the words in the Bible because he's really set it up um, exactly the way it should be. Now the other thing I noticed that God does when I can't find a definition for something is he uses the verse numbers sometimes, now not all the time, but as sort of addresses about what he's talking about. And when I was looking for the definition of divineth, I saw a pattern happening in verses 5 and 15 he was talking about dreaming, dreaming, and then interpreting it. So when we get to several chapters later and we want to know what interpret dream the dream is, um, we've got the word divine and divine. So looking at those verse numbers, going back in those same places through chapter 37, 40, 40, and 41, 5 and 15, he's talking about the same thing and he's going to give you the definition. So sometimes you have to go a little bit further in your search to try to find something.